Hi, everyone. So we're going to talk about political parties today as part of our little lecture. There will be an assignment that is associated with this uh, about where Democrats and Republicans, the two major parties that belong in the United States today, where they stand on particular issues. Uh, but we're going to talk basically why the political parties exist and uh, what they look like here in the United States. So you have three essential questions that I want you to answer on Canvas as part of the assignment for this uh, lecture. And that is, why do we have political parties? What is the advantage and disadvantage of a two-party system? And then what is gerrymandering? What potential impacts of gerrymandering ha can have on democracy? So those are questions uh, to pay attention to as we are going through the lectures today. So first of all, political parties, it's a group of people who seek control of government through the winning of elections and the holding of public offices. Essentially, uh, it's an organization to try to promote uh, winning uh, so that they can continue to promote issues uh, that they stand by and so forth. Um, sometimes it can be persons or groups joined together on the basic common principles um, where they stand on certain issues and uh, they seek to try to control governments in order to kind of put out um, laws that uh, fit in with their ideology or their principles um, altogether. So. Um, so we have two major parties in the United States. Um, they are the Republicans and Democrats. Um, they sometimes are referred to as conservatives, which would be more Republicans, and liberals, which would be more Democrats. And so, um, what do these two parties do? Okay, so without going into the issues themselves or where they stand on certain issues, um, first of all, the major thing is that they nominate candidates. Uh, they find quality candidates, uh, people they think could potentially win in um, a district. Uh, that they'd be running for public office in, um, and uh, they try to basically nominate them to be, help them through the process of nominating, getting nominated to be the representative of their party in the election, and hopefully eventually win in the election itself so they can be uh, come into power in government, okay? Um, they use lots of resources. Both these parties have an enormous amount of resources and money to be able to uh, try to get more supporters uh, for their candidates, uh, inform them on the issues as well as try to get more people signed up to vote, uh, trying to convince people why they should vote for this person, why they should vote at all sometimes in many cases. Uh, but that's what political parties are aiming at doing. They're trying to get more people to be constituents, more people to vote so that their candidates can win and hold political office and pass laws that fit in with their, their ideology, right? Um, so they also act as a bonding agent. So basically, um, they're trying to ensure good performance, good behavior, basically, so that, um, you know, all members of a party that they are going to, um, you know, live uh, and, and govern by the principles of the, of the, the, the party itself, um, so that they stay kind of true to what the platform of the party is uh, on issues and policies and so forth. Okay. Uh, they also are an important part of governing. They are going to, um, you know, work together to try to pass laws. We've talked about in the legislative branch in Congress, where you have members of the you know, each parties where they are basically what they call the whips, but they, they count up the, whose votes are whose and such, and, and try to convince members who are descending from what the party wants and so forth. Um, and then, you know, try to give them support on issues that, uh, that are important to that particular individual. So they will vote on, on bigger, uh, important items as well. So, um, they can also ask to access watchdogs, watchdogs, the, um, you know, both parties, uh, tend to, keep each other in check to make sure that neither one of them are um, acting corrupt in any manner. Um, and so that's, you know, you see that in, in recent years with uh, Trump's impeachment, uh, you know, where the Democrats saw the some of the actions of the, the president as uh, corruptible or um, improper. And so, you know, they moved forward to try to remove him. But then the Republicans also saw the actions of the Democrats as trying to remove an elected president um, from office. And so both of them were kind of fighting against each other. All right. So the two-party system is something that's been very common in the United States. What do you need to that sense? 
go to other democracies around the world, uh, uh, France in the north, and Canada, the UK, Germany, they have multiple parties. They all have this um, You know, the fact that there aren't uh, alternative third parties, they are the same as the other countries. But for the longest time, been kind of a two-party system. We have two major parties in the country, okay? Um, there are actually dozens overall, but the ones who garner most of the votes and support um, from the voters. And you have very few independents in uh, elected office today in the federal government. You'll find more so in the federal government, um, but as as the United States Senate, there are two independents. Um, why is that? Well, you know, there's lots of reasons, and, 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 and more so. Uh, we'll talk about some of those also. So, lots of different third parties. Um, and some of these, uh, have a history no longer exists. For example, the Whig Party, um, which has got the little hour. The Whig Party was, uh, around during the 1830s and 1840s, and it primarily was in response to Andrew Johnson's presidency, where a lot of uh, people within the Republican Party felt that Andrew Johnson had become um, too powerful as an executive, um, ignoring some of the traditional um, you know, laws that keep checks on his power. And so they referred to him as King Andrew the First. And so the Whig Party was created in opposition to much of what Andrew Jackson was doing because the Whig Party in England uh, was the party that was uh, against the, the rule of the king. And so that's kind of you know a fun little story on the side there of why that was around. But obviously when Andrew Jackson left uh, office, you know the Whig Party doesn't really survive much longer. Uh, many of them incorporate back into either Democrat or Republicans um, of that day and age, mostly Republicans. Um, so, you know, other political parties, the Tea Party, which uh, came around during the Obama years, um, you know, much of their party platform was about to government expenditures um, and taxation, feeling that the government, the federal government in particular, had become too big and too powerful and taxes became too intrusive. Um, and so they, you know, formulated to try to oppose the expansion of government, social welfare programs and other things, um, and to try to um, create where there's less taxes and less expenditures by the government itself. Um, but there's a bunch of other ones I can talk about. Um, you know, there's more every year. I know there's like a new conservative party that's made its way into uh, states like Utah. Um, where people in Utah are generally conservative-minded individuals, um, but then this is trying to provide an alternative party, the Republican Party, which many people in Utah um, have um, rejected much of the uh, policies and principles of President Trump um, as not being conservative enough or um, lacking some sort of moral objective. I'm not exactly sure how to word that. Uh, as unbiased as it's possible, but essentially it's just an alternative uh, conservative party that's uh, kind of come around. Um, but yeah, libertarians, they've been around for a while and have had people running an election, Green Party, same thing. Um, you know, the Green Party's platform is mainly about environmental issues. Uh, so they, they're they an issue party, and so they kind of focus on a couple of major issues, and one of theirs is the environment, right? But again, why would the two-party system? Uh, first of all, history. We've always started out with two. When you go back to the beginning of our country, you know, where we are established in the Constitution, um, you had two major factions uh, over the ratification of the Constitution, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And for the Federalists, they felt the Constitution was a, a great document that uh, would limit government's power and stop any potential uh, corruption and, and harms that... Uh, they saw during the time in which the um, the colonies were under the rule of the king. 
the, and there was the anti-federalists who saw that the government uh, had become too centralized, too powerful, and they were afraid of a uh, repeat of what happens under the days of colonialism. Um, and so, you know, we know that eventually the Constitution was ratified because the anti, um, anti-federalists anti were more in favor of, like, getting a Bill of Rights to, to further um, limit government's power and so forth, and that eventually is something that does happen. But we've always had two, and then, you know, over time we've had different political parties. Um, you know, we started off with Federalists, Anti-Federalists, when Anti-Federalists became Republicans. And then uh, over time, there's uh, the new Democratic Party that uh, Andrew Johnson, or I'm sorry, Andrew Jackson was the first Democratic president. Um, but the, the party of the Democrats of Andrew Jackson are a lot different than the party of Democrats today. And the same thing with the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. It was very different than the Republican Party of of today as well. And and I'm not going to get into the details of that, but if you do your research on history and where they stand on issues, um, you know, the different time periods, uh, you cannot just say one party is the same all the way through. They've kind of changed their um, stance on issues and then a lot, they're supportive of a lot of issues that are no longer issues in the country today. Um, as I mentioned, federal standard federal tradition. We've just, you know, with the history comes tradition. We've always traditionally had made two major political parties and such. Um, you know, there are because of the the way our system works, um, where we have um, a single member of the House of Representatives represented by one district. Um, it's just much easier to have two major parties in a winner take all system. Imagine, if you will, if we had a um, a multi-party. Say we had six major parties in this country, right? We have one district that is vying for the, um, there's six major parties vying for one district, uh, control of one district or not control, but, um, representation of one district. And say that you, you had the votes and such, and the top vote getter ended up getting 27% of the vote. Um, do you really think it's going to work very well if only 27% of that district voted for that person? Um, imagine if it was the presidential election, if we only had like, you know, if we had six different candidates and um, if major parties and the person who ends up getting the most of the majority of the votes is ends up with like 33 percent, you know, a third of the country is going to elect a person who represents the entirety of the country. That's the problem. It's easier to say majority rules in a democracy when you only have two major parties where there's a clearly going to be a, a, a clear majority who wins. Um, and that's that's ultimately, I think, why we do end up having this, this two-party system. Um, so in our system of government, which we talked about when we talked about the executive branch, um, you know, you have states that are more conservative. You have states that are more democratic. Um, this is what the 2016 Electoral College map looked like. Um, and the blue are states that voted for Hillary Clinton. The red are states that voted for Donald Trump as far as majority goes. Um, and of course, you know, that changes uh, all the time. And we, we looked at 270 to win that website and how it's changed over time. Um, but, you know, the, the, the winner take all system, you know, it's easier to where you have one clear winner in each state uh, to get the person uh, that electoral votes and such. Um, this is kind of how it breaks down by county um, in the country today, um, where you know a lot of the areas where you see are mostly red. These are areas that typically, typically not 100 percent, but typically are more rural. And then the areas that are highlighted more in blue, typically states that are more urban. And that's something that you will see as a trend that Democrats tend to be more attractive to people who live in urban areas who want more government programs and involvement um, in rural areas less so because, you know, they've, they don't need as much government oversight or intervention at all. So that's a lot of times how it breaks down. All right. So the problems with the system, though, is that no political party will fit all of your beliefs. And, you know, for me personally, I, I tend to lean one side over another, um, but it's not uh, 100%. There's a lot of issues that um, the party that I tend to vote with, uh, I don't necessarily agree with their stance on that. Um, so it's tough. And so you have to weigh the entirety of um, a candidate where they stand on issues and so forth. Um, and, and to make the choice 
Sometimes it's the best choice. Sometimes it's the least worst choice. And that's sometimes how people feel about the part two party system is that you have the choice between not great and even worse. Um, and if you talk to a lot of people who voted in the 2016 election, a lot of people will feel the same way. And then there's a lot of people who feel like, hey, one of my candidates was just the best candidate that we could possibly have. So, all right. Um, there are liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, and we call them moderates overall in such. And so there are people who um, do not fall in line with every single issue of that party. Um, and that can be difficult sometimes, especially when we talk about governance, um, where moderates uh, tend to, they will be more willing to break away from what the party wants. And so as a result, you know, they're, I think it's a good thing, but, uh, you know, you tend to have more uh, negotiation or sometimes more deadlock because uh, neither party can get a majority um, in a uh, hands down vote just based off of party lines. Uh, if you have people who are willing to vote against what the party wants. Um, so that can sometimes create deadlock as well. Um, in trying to find a basic consensus uh, between the two parties can be difficult uh, for those reasons as well. Okay. The other option, though, is the multi-party system, as I mentioned, um, usually have multi-member districts. Um, and if they do that, um, they, in order to get to the majority, you have to build coalitions with each other. So um, in parliamentary systems, which you find in, in countries like Germany, UK, um, Canada, most democracies in the world uh, do have a parliamentary system where they have these multiple multiple political parties. In order to rule, in order to expect victory, and so if you have a political party that's the 30% of the vote, that's not the majority. So in order for them to establish a, a government, they need to go hold on the party so they can probably find a political party a and say, hey, come on board with us. We will work on this issue with you. Um, and they get two more. So now they're 6% short. So then they find another that has 8% um, or 7%. Um, and again, making the reasons where he has to join the goal. Vote for you to be the majority of the world's long campaign on this issue. Which, you know, it can be effective. It can create a system where more voices up. But there's also the, the danger of, you know, if you can't do it, it's a whole other campaign on this issue. And that kind of fails. And that's the way that's Italy, for example, they have, they, they really struggle um, they have so many different things where you have clearly that's divided to the north and south and very hopefully different from one another and so greatly united the government in part many um, Actions can take over. And the other issue, the other option is what um, Which then leads to a lot of good choice calls. And so, that is something that, uh, you know, in America, I can't imagine. Um, so, uh, one party membership, uh, it's not one thing, each person is going to make a line of the party. Um, sometimes, uh, that whether Family, the case, um, the of 
Democrats, generally, uh, and this is not 100% like the whole mindset, union members, or you know, other people, uh, especially very elderly, um, tend to be more democratic. And elderly is kind of split in, in different ways. Uh, you know, there are issues in which elderly uh, people are very much uh, concerned about that Democrats tend to um, focus on um, more so than Republicans, uh, uh, such as Social Security. Uh, Republicans generally are whites, they're males, they're Protestants, um, business owners, wealthy, middle-aged. Um, and again, this is not like 100%, oh yeah, absolutely, you're gonna, if you're this, you're going to be this party. It's not necessarily true. But this is kind of generally is what we see when we look at uh, the demographics of each political party. All right, so that moves to the last thing we're going to talk about, which is gerrymandering. And political parties play a role in gerrymandering very much so. So this is what happens when states redraw the voting districts after each census. Um, and so when they take the census and then, you know, they are expected to kind of draw the line and try to create um, a balanced uh, representation. Now, when this happens, um, something that uh, the So when they do be broken, they can do so by trying to break the party split up. And we just have a one party is strong for the open. So in Utah, in New Hampshire, in Utah, it seems by and large, generally a Republican state. Almost all of our representatives are Republican. Both our senators are Republican. Uh, however, they do have democratic strongholds that are on the ground in the same day. And I mentioned earlier that where do we find Democrats more commonly in the Because issues that hit urban areas usually require more government intervention. And that is something that, you know, Republicans don't typically want to see, um, at least certainly not to a high extent. So Salt Lake, because it is a you know, strong democratic, you know, um, stronghold, um, you know, they decided when they, they redrew the boundaries back in 2010, that they are going to draw the boundaries. Uh, actually, I think it was 2012. I can't remember. It's been so long. Um, they redrew the boundaries and they split. So you can see Salt Lake right in this box here. It has three different, four different uh, districts. I mean, like here's District 1, but then it cuts into this Northeast Salt Lake area. And then you have District 2, which is made up of Tooele, which is really rural, as I used to live there. And then all these areas are very rural. And then you have it go right down the center of Salt Lake and take up much of what is Salt Lake. And then, um, you know, 4th District... Um, which is uh, represented by Ben McAdams um, today. Um, they that also I mean so you got half of Salt Lake pretty much almost all of Salt Lake where you have a lot of Democrats and then you have um, Utah Valley which is very Republican. You know so that is something that has happened. Um, you know and then of course District Three also cuts into here. So this is done in a way that basically makes it so it's harder for Democrats to get a representative in Congress. Um, ben McAdams, who is a very moderate Democrat, um, you know, was able to defeat Mia Love in 2018 election. Um, but he's going to be up for re-election again, and Republicans are gunning for his seat. So they're going to put a lot of resources to try to get whoever goes up against Ben McAdams elected and it's easier to do because they've gerrymandered Salt Lake so much that 
you really have a hard time winning as a Democrat. And Utah is not the only state that's done this. You know, there have been other states. Um, recently, the Supreme Court ruled that Pennsylvania was so badly gerrymandered that they had to redraw the district lines to make the elections more fair. And that had a huge impact on the 2018 elections. North Carolina, same thing. Um, they have split across you know, African-American communities, uh, you know, different district lines to try to lessen the, the votes uh, of you know, uh, what would be a Democratic stronghold in, the, in places like Charlotte. So this occurs all over the world. And so um, Democratic, eh, maybe not. But let's go back to our essential questions again to, for you to answer. And it feels like forever ago, but here we go. I should have put this on the end. All right. Again, yeah, essential questions for today uh, and answer them in Canvas. Why do we have political parties? What is the advantage and disadvantage of the two-party system? And what is gerrymandering and what is the potential impacts of gerrymandering on democracy? So take some time to answer those questions. Do so in complete sentences. Um, and then there will be an assignment that is going to be tied to this. Uh, it's going to be Democrats and Republicans on the issues. So research uh, where Democrats and Republicans stand on uh, certain issues um, and uh, go ahead and just write a summarized uh, you know, answer for what they do. So do that in your research. Uh, until next time, I'll see you all later.